kind of soft though. Hi. Usually when I'm on stage, it's either with exercise clothes and with the mic that's hanging on from here. But today it's hanging from the other side, so I'm just going to give it a try. Uh, my name is Victor. I am the head of design for Bain and Company. Any one of you know what Bain and Company does? Show of hands. Quick show of hands. Quick show of hands. Few. All right. So Bain is one of the three top uh, strategic consulting in the world. Where there's Bain. There's Boston Consulting and there's McKinsey, the BBM uh, consulting of the groups. So today, um, what I'm trying to do now is basically trying to bring you guys towards uh, right design and you design right. So hopefully, I can convince you enough that I don't confuse you later. And with that, let's start. Right, my name is Victor. Um, right now, the head of design for APEC. So Bain has a few offices around the world, and APEC is one of them that overseeing all the way from like India up to the greater China, down to uh, Australasia, which is like Australia and New Zealand. So it's a very big market. And my role there, it's mostly looking at how design can be incorporated into the consulting world. And that's where, when you see like, consulting arm, working with design, sometimes it's a brush, sometimes it's a, it's a clash, but how we can bring value of design into a consulting world and straight away bring it like um, the results into companies or clients that came to Bain. And throughout the journey, uh, I started myself as industrial designer and moved on from industrial design into doing uh, interaction design. So when I first started in UX, there's no such thing called UX. It's just known as HCI or uh, IX. So that was a term coined when I was first started doing UX design. And from there, I kind of like grew up, grew into the role of like drawing syllabus for Tamase, moving into startup firms, going into fintech where I think Stephanus will talk about it later, and then going to IBM IX. So that's where I wanted to see how technology can uh, merge together with consulting. So that's where IBM IX comes into play. And there onwards, I just felt like, hey, you know, maybe I should just go into a better consulting group like the top tier. And that's where I am today, Bain & Co. So for today's talk, I want to bring you guys to the idea of like, in the past, before uh, everything started, it's just making people want things. You know, like companies, when they, when they throw products out, uh, most of the time, it's like they go through online marketing or digital marketing, trying to bring the value of like, say, hey, this product is good and get you convinced with the product to get on with the product. How many of you buy into those BS today? Not that much anymore because consumer has grown more mature in thinking, grow more wise in terms of like able to sieve out all this BS for actual values that they're getting. And also at the same time, uh, in today, you're driven by like market trends, things that are evolving around the world, consumer behaviors that's changing. Take, for example, millennial. How many millennials will shop versus millennials that's in China will shop? It's totally different. So in China itself, for example, you have uh, your little emperor generation. So those that have done consumer research and uh, studies, you realize that there was this group called the little emperors that started in China where it's a one-child policy, this child gets what they want. Now, this group of consumer, this group of kids, have grown into consumer power, meaning that they already started earning money and how they can spend that amount of money. And they realize that, hey, with this amount of money that they earn, they can't really get what they want when back when they were a little kid. I want this, mommy, daddy buys it. I want that, mom and dad gets it. So they got almost everything that they want when they were young. But now when they're adult and when they're earning their hard-earned money, they start to realize that, hey, they can't really get what they want fully. So there's this group of little emperor um, consumers that's out there. So that's in consumer trends. Um, stiffer competition today, take for example your mobile phones. Everyone is trying to add more and more features for you to, be, to stay competitive ahead. Who would even strip down their phone? Who would go back to a Nokia 3310? Anyone of you know Nokia 3310? Okay, those that hands up, you know your age. Huh? It's literally a phone that you can throw and kill someone with. 
and as well as social influence today. You have all those social influencers, your Facebook, your Instagram, people say something, there goes your product. All this stuff. Uh. <laughs> Change? So all this is gearing towards making things people want, where design comes into play, creating digital solutions, creating experiences that at the end of the day when people are buying stuff, it's no longer what marketing tries to sell you. you know, it's more towards like at the end of the day, you're influenced by market trends, you're in influenced by your, the way that you buy, the way that you spend, the competitors that are in the market that you can see, consumers are getting wiser. So that's where power of design, power of UX comes into play. Apparently, I need to stand here. Stand here. Yeah. So design is no longer making things pretty. Like when you were in digital marketing, a lot of stuff is just like, hey, smack something on, make it look pretty, make it look sexy, ship it out. And today, you can't do that. But all the directors, all the senior people, in any company is still having that mindset. So one clear example would be like maybe when I was in IBM, there was this client that came by to us. Red in color, do entertainment, somewhere in Sentosa. So the biggest person that's running the project, we were saying that, hey, design is all about iteration, all about research. You need to pack things nicely, complete it in round one, phase one, go to phase two, iterate in phase three, this person comes back and like, nope. Can you do everything in one? No more changes. I give it to the developer. No more changes, and I get to ship it out. So there's still all this old mindset, you know, like, oh, your job designer, you make it pretty, right? Just make it look nice, lah. Very fast, right? Three months, right? Why three months? Three weeks, lah. How many of you have that kind of like feeling? How many of you face those at work? No, no one. Come on, hands up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically when you talk about making things look sexy, making things look nice and pretty, it's always the surface that people see. What people don't see about our work and our pain is all those at the bottom, ranging from starting from strategy, you build it up, scoping it out. Things are too big, you want to scope it down structures that you build, the skeletal that you build, then only you look at the surface. Any iceberg, people look at it, wow, sweet, very nice. But what's underneath it is something that people do not know. And that's our job to make the unknown known. But in today's talk, I'm just going to focus on one area, I'm not going to talk the whole piece. And that one area is to look at how can we dive in deeper into the strategy side of design. So, I was thinking of like, hey, today everyone's going to see a lot of slides. So I decided to draw my own slides. <laughs> and as designers, especially when you're doing strategy, you start to think about like, hey, you're in a role as a designer, doing the aesthetic side of things. But at the same time, you're also in a role of a Sherlock Holmes. At the other side of things, looking at research, looking at insights, understanding needs of the users. So at one side, basically, you, you want to get the right design, going in, finding the crust, finding that needs, finding that insight, the problems that people face. Then only you look to the right side and like, hey, you want to design right. Down, right? Yeah. Um, part of designing right would be like, for example, shift one pixel of an icon. Turn this color purple. Instead of round buttons, make it square buttons. You know? Those are like smaller little things that you can do later on. But first, let's get that foundation right. What I mean by foundation is like, if you want to build a whole big bloody condo or a big skyscraper, first thing is you need to get that foundation that's nailed to the floor correct. If that foundation is like building on stilts, you know, like the um, long houses, like stilts, how can you stack a condo on top? Sooner or later, all these condo layers is like a feature that you're building. If your foundation is not strong, the whole building will just crumble and fall. Right, let's go into this little drawing. So in order to have that 
right design, first thing is that you need to have that right mindset, the right skills for you to dive into. So what my belief is, it's just my model, um, designers need to be like a bloodhound. So able to identify needs, um, empathize with users, understand the user's problems, then you bring all these problems, surface it up towards your project, towards your stakeholders to know that, hey, at the end of the day, maybe your client says that, uh, let's think, they want an app. You know, but after you've done all the studies, you realize that, hey, the app is not the real thing. Maybe it's just pen and paper drawn up into a sort card, that kind. So you're able to surface all these insights up later on to your stakeholders through your research as a bloodhound. What I mean by that? As a bloodhound, you want to do research. So these are all the, the research studies that you can adopt. But this is not exhaustive, right? So to me, as a bloodhound, being a designer, um, those that have heard my previous talk, a designer is like Batman, right? All these little things at the bottom is just like Batman's utility belt. It will grow, and you need to grow it. You cannot stay stagnant with this set, and then you expect to go to fight Joker, la, fight Penguin, la, fight someone else, same set of utility belt. You know? Have you seen Batman in 19, 1990s to 2000? His utility belt keeps changing. Right? So you guys, as a designer, with your tools and your traits, you need to keep upgrading, keep changing, and keep reinforcing. Then, can I do a little bit of a quick test with you guys? Uh, it should load. So sorry about it. Meant to have one poll that you guys are supposed to try it out, but it's not working. Let's keep that. Um, Part of doing research, that poll EV was just to get a whole, get a feel of like, as designers in the room, what is that most comfortable uh, user research method that you use? And that kind of get a whole of like a map, a word map of uh, what's the most popular uh, method that pops up in between the whole uh, audience that's in the room today. But forget about it. So next part of that right mindset is diving in as a six, to have this sixth sense. Meaning that as designers, while you're doing all this research with users, the other part of it that you, if you want to push your design further, you need to understand what's going on outside. And that is to be able to identify trends that's happening around the world. What I meant. Trends, to me, it happens in these three phases. Uh, and in these three phases, it starts as a droplet, meaning that it's, a, it's like a weak signal in the market and it goes into a ripple stage, and it goes into a wave. So I'm going to give you some storytelling. As a droplet stage, take for example, when Google Glass first came out, everyone was like, wow, very good, very good, Google Glass. But Google Glass died. Why? Because market is not ready, cost is too high, uh, technology haven't reached that level yet, application no one knows how to use. Everyone look at it, it's like, wow, very nice. But the whole thing just died down. So that's when it hits a weak signal stage, meaning that it looks interesting. Everyone wants it, but no one knows how the hell to use it. And that product died in a droplet stage. But some products survive. Um, anyone of you, before you know about Maverick Pro, who knows Maverick Pro? Everyone knows, right? The drone that can snap video and so forth. But before Maverick Pro came out, there was another version known as Lily. Anyone knows that? So Lily is this round color plate that the moment you throw, it just opens propeller and start floating. And then the wearer will just wear a unit here to say that I want to follow or I want Lily to lead. Meaning that if I were to run and Lily follows me, it takes my back view. If Lily leads, it means that Lily is in front. Wherever angle I move, it takes a front view of me. But when it first came out, Kickstarter, wow, a lot of money went into it. But project died. Why? Technology was not there that Wi-Fi you need in order to get that reception and that smartness for Lily to move wherever the user is moving is not there as well. On concept, it looks very good, but when it's fully tested out to roll, it never achieved into production rollout. So that died, it's died as well. But someone took Lily and changed it into Maverick Pro. So when, it goes, when things change and move in into a ripple stage, Ripple stage is the most exciting stage of any trends when you're doing. 
Take, for example, today, AI, VR. These are things that everyone is trying out. But let's rewind your clock a little bit into smartwatch. When smartwatch first came out in the Ripple stage, that's when a lot of exploration happened, right? <coughs> Nike was doing tracking, monitoring. Do you know that Volkswagen did a smartwatch as well? And this smartwatch allows me to tss, car start, left, car move forward, tss, open the door. But what happened to it? All this exploration is nice, everyone explore, but practicality of it is not there. So Ripple stage is the stage that is most interesting for any designer to play if you're able to scout those trends. Another area, take for example, FinTech. <laughs> so around the world, people are talking about, hey, you want to pay with, with like um, PayWave, different modes of payment. All these are still within that Ripple stage. You've got Paytm in India, you got, I don't know, you need to throw some names at me, man. <laughs> uh, huh? Ofo, <laughs> oh, 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 in Indonesia. A, a lot of those digital wallets that are out there, right? But this is a stage that, that while well, everyone is trying out like which wallet is the best, let's move a little bit forward into the wave stage. In China, everything has surpassed the wave, uh, surpassed the ripple, and it's already in the wave, mainstream. Rewind a little bit more to your smartwatch. Today, smartwatch is in mainstream. And what does smartwatch do today? Monitoring, see your message. Does it even allow you to remote control your car? No longer, right? So at this stage when it's a wave, it's already a stage that when uh, innovation is kind of a little bit stagnant, where you're going more into like the optimization side of things. I don't mean that it's fully stagnant, but there are still players that are playing on it. Take for example, payment, right? The same I talk about fintech payment, but now you move this into a context of China. And in China, payment is so advanced today, I think Cindy knows about it, we were talking, that, you know in Chinese, right, you got this saying that shua ka si fan, meaning that you take your card, swipe to pay. But in China, if you follow trends, you monitor trends, there's this company, Xiaomi, Face++, and KFC, three companies collaborating together, trying to create a new form of payment and that is facial recognition. And in China, there already this, this kidding verb of like, you no longer shua ka si fan, it's shua lian si fan, meaning that you're swiping your face to pay. And how you swipe your face to pay is, smile is like an acknowledgement of payment. Stand there, smile, and you pay. <laughs> yeah. So, Exercising your sixth sense is basically diving in, working with trend forecast company, identifying trends, track your trends. No forecast company is going to give you to say that, hey, this is the thing that you need to look at. If your company is fintech, like, oh, these are the trends. This falls in what model? So this model is something that I created in order for me to track where trends are moving, and it helps to bring back in into the projects that we're doing. How you bring that in, it depends on like how you story tell and weave it into maybe your storyboards, weave it into your inspiration board before like maybe a workshop or when in the middle of workshop, in the middle of ideation, you weave it into uh, your scenario boards, for example. So exercising sixth sense, important. Let's come back. Designers itself, just now mentioned that one side of it, you have this creative side. The other side of this, you have this detective side. I feel that as designers, you have this mutant power, not just being able to juggle uh, the research side of things or even the design side of things. To me, joining Bain gave me a whole new perspective of like there's this other side of design that you need to look at, which is design ROI, where you look at the business side of things. And as being mutant power is not enough, <coughs> You need to look at all those design research that comes back from your first part as a bloodhound, or the secondary research, or your desk research. And on top of the desk research, you still have your trend studies that you have done, how you synthesize everything together. Remember the, ice, the, the, the iceberg itself, that whole depth that people don't see? These are all small little things that compound up and people don't understand. So always make yourself known in each phases, doing like retrospective, doing playbacks, sharing with your stakeholders so that people understand what design is doing. Most important part, which I feel is business alignment, because at the end of the day, who pays your paycheck, right? It's business that's paying your paycheck. You cannot be doing like 
all, this is all the stuff that we need to find out. These are all the things that are good for design, but if it doesn't bring, bring money to the company, yeah, it's a no-go. So business alignment, combining all of that, then only you drive a strategy forward to say that, hey, this is the vision. I've painted this. From all the mess that I found out, all the messy things that I found out, I bring it down to this perspective. Hey, I want to move here. Are you all OK? These are all the business ROI, the design ROI, that forward uh, vision that you draw. Going back. So having all this circle, you ended up with this space of like you are charting what I call the uncharted space, uh, where how you're going to drive and plan that strategy forward. For designers, you always want the best for user. You are the, you are the end user advocate. But because we work in a company, so there's always constraints that we need to circle on, right? And that constraint itself is time. You can have a lot of time. The more time you have, the more time you can you know, get your research refined. Like working in Bain, for example, research time that I, when I work in HP, research is like three weeks. But in Bain, it's like, OK, three days. You need to get it done. And how much that compromise you can do. So like today's context, I have my designer that's yesterday flew to Thailand for a project. And in that project itself, her time constraint is so jammed down. She started with like 20 people that she wanted to interview, and she only has like five days. So 20 people, five location, how can she do everything? So the more senior you are, the more you're able to cut corners a little bit, but you still get that gist that you want to run. Money is a problem. In terms of funding, um, if you're running in a big corporation or MNC, an in-house team, Usually, money is already allocated for you. But if you're running a consulting group where the client already paid X amount of money, you need to go and fight for this X amount of money in order for you to do your research. And it's almost, almost impossible to run a full-fledged research. Like, how can you cut the research down so it's comprehensive enough to get enough detail, but you don't uh, make a fluff, you know, like research? At the end of the day, information, meaning that how much you gather is enough for you to run into your strategy. You know, how much information that you gather, how much you receive, that's enough for you to run. So these three are your main constraints. And when you plot everything together, who uses a double diamond uh, process? One, two, three, four. OK. La. So it's basically from an unknown that you want it to be known. Something that is ambiguous to something that's a bit more firmed up, right? So you draw your two uh, diamonds across. You want, to you want to diverge based on um, all the information that you find, and then you converge back. So one side of the coin basically speaks to you of how you want to path your strategy before you're going in into doing that design, actual design work. So what I try to say here is that at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, while designers stand in this middle part, you might be very good in one side, you know, like the aesthetic side, the visual design side of things. But there's also one side that right now in market is very valued, which is how can you draw strategy. So using that double diamond method is helping people to understand that hey, one side is all about designing the right stuff, while the other end of the spectrum is Making it look a bit prettier, but you need to know how to make it look prettier. But in reality, um, double diamond is not really so nicely diamond across two sides. So I need your help in this next part. Can you also take out your phone, go to your Safari, or go to your browser, go kahoot.it. Go to kahoot.it, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. Uh, right, guys. Can you just go to kahoot.it and key in uh, the game pin and with your uh, user nick? By the way, there's no price for this, so it's just more of interactivity.
There's 200 now. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's start. Right, I only have like five questions for you guys, okay? Remember that double diamond that we created? So in which context will you use a double diamond process? Hmm, picture didn't come out. Yeah. So it's an equal double diamond. In which context will you use an equal double diamond process? Is it for aesthetic purposes? Is it for problem solving? 110 people, awesome. So it's more because you're standing in the middle, you have both sides, that it's created for problem solving. Next one. Oh, you need to press next. Cool banana. Right, next quiz. Let's distort the double diamond a little bit, okay? Now let's pull the diamond longer to the front. Now it looks like an inverted uh, insect now. So when it's longer to the front, what do you think it's supposed to be for? So when the process is pulled longer front and forward, awesome. So that part is more of trying for you to frame a problem, something that you do not know. You need a little bit longer time, a little bit more uh, context, more interaction with that user, thus you pull that double diamond longer to the front. Next. Glow. Next one. Let's try to twist that double diamond a little bit more. How about this? I pull the front a little bit longer, the back slightly longer. What do you think it's for? Nice. So if you're pulling both sides of your double diamond long, what it's usually done for like functionality and usability testing, where the front part is you want to understand like what's failing today. That's where you do all your heuristic studies, for example, uh, understanding with your users. Once you already designed that, you go in for a further test. That further test allows you to more have more iteration task. That's why the back is a bit more longer than the front. Last one, Mojo Jojo. What's yours, Cindy? Oh. <laughs> ah, now let's reverse it. Let's pull all the way to the back. If you're spending less time forward and you have longer time behind, what do you think you're doing? Wow, very balanced. So it's meant for you to do more on the aesthetic side, where you're spending time adjusting pixel, changing, saying that, hey, square doesn't work. Can I change the circle? Or can I change it to peel shape? That's when you're spending more time towards the back. And thus, you pull your double diamond longer towards the back side. Let's go back to that presentation. So we have a winner, Mojo Jojo, followed by, who's Mojo Jojo here? No one there to own up? <laughs> Okay, well done for uh, playing this game with me. Lastly, you need to swap back to... Right. So, end of it, at the end of the day, a double diamond doesn't mean that, that um, you're doing one side more than the other. Sometimes a designer has more tendency towards one front. Uh, sometimes a more balanced designer is throughout. So it helps to have like both sides of the coin, being able to do the right thing, meaning that you're doing a lot of experience strategy, drawing that strategy, that's where the fuzzy logic is. And spending time at the back doesn't mean that you're not doing strategy, you're still doing some form of a strategy, but it's more towards creating that experience in that design. And with that itself, um, sorry for all the hiccups, hope you guys have a little bit 
uh, understanding into like why you want to dive more into the front side of design before you're starting to make things look prettier at the end. Thank you. Sorry, so maybe we'll just take one very quick question. Sure. Um, and the question is, I guess, you know, with a consulting company like Bain, uh, how is design sort of regarded? Uh, and also, you know, would people, uh, a consulting firm, be more prone to kind of using uh, out-of-the-box solutions? Mm, okay, how, cons how design is regarded in consulting is like in today's context itself, a lot of firms that comes to the big three or even the big four, uh, while they want their business to be fixed, sometimes a lot of business have touched the digital side of things. And when you touch the digital side of things, it comes into um, my team. So I'm leading the team called ADAPT, Advanced Design and Digital Team. And this team literally looks at all the digital solutions that pans across in the client's company. But sometimes we don't just do digital, we go, we go into like service design or even go in into like uh, customer journey throughout the entire customer journey, understanding and creating that omni-channel design. So it's almost, uh, very flexible and a lot of room for you to play. By the way, we're hiring, so <laughs> if anyone interested to know. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. Yeah. And uh, we'd, like to, we'd just like to present a quick token, token of appreciation to Victor. Thank you.